The video game landscape is filled today to the brim with open world first person shooters where you even get to decide how you can approach an objective, either go in stealthily or blow everything up and then hope there's somebody left at the end to give you some kind of reward. This was not always the case. These games were exceptions at first. And it can be said that one of the first games to really drive this idea into the mainstream was Far Cry. Now in itself that it was not completely an open world game, but it had open environments, lush jungles to which you could navigate whichever way you wanted to, and it gave you the ability to approach objectives, in some cases, I mean not always, you could unstealth that helicopter at the end in any way that you choose to. But what if I told you that one year before Far Cry, a very similar game just showed up out of nowhere, made by a bunch of guys named Pavel at a studio that up until then had made nothing noteworthy, at least outside of Poland, a studio called Techland. You may know the studio now as the creators of many, many, many interesting franchises like Call of Juarez, or Dead Island, or Dying Light, or hell, even Expand Rally. But back then they didn't have really something catchy to their names, something popular, something that truly gripped the attention of the world. So they made Chrome, or as it's best known, the Adventures of J.C. Newcomb, the guy from the Chad meme, and the Crash Test Dummy. This has got to be one of the worst names that a video game can have nowadays, because if you were to search Chrome game, especially using Google, you'd almost have to go to the second page to find this game and not the thing with the dinosaur that shows up when your internet is down in Chrome. Apart from its name, one of the reasons why it may not be well known today is that a year later Far Cry came out and it had some arguably better gameplay in some places, but it also had something else, something very important to that time in history. It had pixel shader. If you're watching the video now in the background and not just listening to my voice, you may be seeing a game that looks Okay, what I can tell you is that when it came out, it looked amazing. This was before Half-Life 2, this was before Doom 3 and its polygonal heads. This game looked amazing. And sure, sometimes shadows could be seen on the wrong side of a floor, but it really captured the feeling of being in a forest, in a densely, vegetatively populated area doing sneaky stuff, blowing stuff up, or just stuffing stuff into other stuff. You got an inventory is what I mean. Had they have put pixel shader into this game, maybe just for the water, it would have made Chrome memorable to this day for everybody, not just the people that lived in Eastern Europe and maybe, you know, were interested in what Declan was making or got the game for free from the level video games magazine. When cranked in the highest detail, which is something I couldn't do back then actually, Chrome gives you an incredible sense of a lush, vibrant world. Even though it's a couple of trees, some sprite grass and structures made out of prefabs that repeat so much you would think they were randomly generated or something. And it looks so good. Because this was essentially the tech demo of the Chrome engine. Now, if you're not familiar with that engine, that's okay. I mean, it's not what you would call amazingly popular nowadays. It's not at the level of Unreal, of CryEngine. It's not at the level of Unity even, or whatever other engines you may think of. But back then, the Chrome engine was something that could not be denied. I'm sure it was mainly used just by Techland, and at some point they'd made it look horrible with that greenish bluish tint that made it look like copper oxidated and decayed. But make no mistake, this was a competent engine that could deliver that kind of detail in 2003. And you didn't even need two graphics cards to run the game like you kind of had to with uh, 
at least the, the, the demo version of Far Cry that they showed off at conventions ran in SLI. It couldn't really run in any other way. But those were different times. I wasn't running SLI back then when I played Chrome. I was running the Pentium 2 with a SIS 512 video card. That's not 512 megabytes of memory. No, 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 no. That was the name of the card. It wasn't what you would call excellent. And the Pentium 2 itself, really not all that helpful. My experience of playing Chrome was mostly looking at the floor. I kid you not, that's how I played it. It was the only way to get over two frames a second. Most of the time I would just look at the floor and then thankfully the game has a radar right there in the middle of the interface telling me if I was close to enemies. Then I'd look up and at two to three frames a second I try to aim and I maybe shoot the enemy. Thankfully it had a god mode and sometimes I would get maybe 10 frames a second if it was a smaller map with fewer trees and less vegetation. But in the many interiors with their many elevators and repeated corridors, things tended to work a bit better. There were even levels set on space stations. Gotta say, going back to it now, with the computer I have now, I am in the exact opposite situation. Chrome isn't available to buy anymore. It used to be on Steam at some point. It's not anymore. And it is not what you would call a well-maintained game. Simply put, it's unplayable if you cross around 150 frames a second, which you can do quite easily by accident just by having a PC made in the last decade. And I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying that if you play it like that, it's going to be one of the worst FPS games you will ever play. The movement is akin to a hippopotamus skating on ice. You will get stuck on objects, you won't be able to move while crouching and you'll have more inertia than a spaceship and a space sim. You'd need a retro thrusters to stop moving or something. When playing it now, I, I just, I didn't get it. I thought that maybe, maybe, because I was playing it at such a low frame rate back then, I never noticed this movement. But no, there, there was no movement like this. You'll sometimes see comments saying, well, yes, this game had inertia and modern games don't have such advanced features. No, it, it had none of that. This is a bug. The game has a bunch of bugs now because of frame rate. Sometimes you won't be able to throw grenades. It's annoying. The enemies can one hit kill you because they're shooting 10,000 bullets in half a second. Thankfully, there are ways in which you can cap the frame rate. None of them worked. The Nvidia control panel didn't work, forcing vSync didn't work. Heard a suggestion that that glide re-implementation would let you do that didn't work. What did actually work in the end, somewhat, was installing a fan-made patch which let you run it in widescreen mode and also remove view distance limitations. Essentially it is something that will make the game run worse. Much, much, much worse. It also introduces some artifacts in terms of level of detail. That is why you may see some enemies in this video as having square-ish heads at a distance when they really shouldn't. That's from the patch, that's not something that was in the game initially, so this may not be a perfect representation of what the game actually has to offer visually. Also, that patch did nothing to address the fact that in interiors it still runs like absolute dog crap. Which is why the gameplay on the background will oftentimes look pathetic. And I can assure you, at least, I remember it being better played on era-appropriate hardware or something lesser than that, it was enjoyable. And it managed to be that way because well, it wasn't just a shooter, this wasn't just Duke Nukem 3D but set in a forest. You had an inventory, you could pick up items that you would find on the dead bodies of your enemies. You could find potato chips lying around, you could find music players that played some songs. There was a heavy Deus Ex vibe to it and not just because of the inventory and the potato chips but also because your character had cybernetic implants, only these ones weren't 
the kind that you would install yourself. They were already installed and it would just take time before they all came online. And they offered you similar abilities to what you would have in those Exnosorts. You'd have a dermal armor, you'd have something that made you aim better, you had something that decreased recoil, you had thermal vision, you had bullet time, which isn't something Deus Ex had. You had bullet time as an implant. And just let me tell you, playing at 5 frames a second, that bullet time was a godsend. Now I can't actually say that the implants were super useful since they consumed a lot of energy and you could never increase the amount of energy that you had, ever. There was no character progression, this was not an RPG. It sort of looked like an RPG, but it wasn't. Your character never got stronger, your character never got the ability to carry more items on their person, your character never got better. Okay, yeah, the, the implants would come online in a specific order, but that's just like getting more weapons as you've progressed further into the game. And it's not really weapons you wanted in this game, it was ammo. Finding enough bullets for your preferred weapon was an issue, especially if you liked sniper rifles. Still, that meant that the game forced you to think creatively. To think about how you could use a grenade to take out three soldiers instead of using bullets. Or maybe sneak up on them and knife them because a knife was a one-hit kill. Getting close to somebody to actually use that knife if they were facing you, um, not really a plan. But you did have some items on you, like the active cloak, which would make you invisible, which is again sort of like the camo from those X because it didn't make you completely invisible. Enemies close enough could still see you. And if you turned on thermal vision, you could feel like the predator, especially if you're in a jungle environment. The game had a sort of variety to it. Yes, I know that I've said that the interiors were copy-pasted and they all look kind of identical to the point where you would get lost sometimes. And the exteriors were essentially vegetation and trees and some sculpted the landscape without a lot of stuff in it, but it did a lot with that. And unlike Far Cry, it wasn't just a jungle. You had a jungle, you had a forest, you had a different type of forest, you had a desert, you had even a snow level, which I didn't get to in the recording, so sorry about that. It had base defense missions, it had boss battles, it even had turret sections that weren't great, but as turret sections go, at least they were exciting. You'd be on the back of a, what the game calls a jeep, trying to keep that jeep alive. You had controllable vehicles, a bunch of them, that you could drive around in areas that were maybe not gigantic, but quite large and filled with enough enemies to run over that it actually made you feel entertained. I don't want to oversell the game, I mean it wasn't the greatest thing to come to the FPS since Wolfenstein 3D, but for the variety it offered in 2003, for the visual detail it offered in 2003, for the kind of levels it offered in 2003, it was great. It even had a story where um, the voice of Duke Nukem plays a character whose name I kind of forget. It's sort of like Duke Nukem with some stupid name. He gets betrayed, finds a new partner, and goes out adventuring in the solar systems, being a bounty hunter slash mercenary, until a fortuitous sequence of events leads him to confront the man that betrayed him. It's not a great story, not particularly well acted either. That's not to say the voice actors didn't do a good job. I mean, they're people that you will know just by their voice because they've been in every video game ever made. And I don't think I'm exaggerating. It's just that the direction is Polish for an English video game. It's passable. It's fine. Don't think about it too much. It even has a multiplayer mode that I've never touched and I don't believe I will in this version of the game since again it will run like absolute crap unless you find a way to cap the frame rate and some tools that are you would think oh yeah it's in the uh, the driver it's right there in the Nvidia control panel surely it will work well it won't what it will do is actually add some really nice anti-aliasing so the game looks even better other than that chrome is currently not just hard to play but 
unenjoyable. It is a game that desperately needs an update. I'm not saying it deserves a remaster again, it was a great game for when it came out. But since then we've had so many more better games that are very similar to this. And in some cases maybe not better but more ambitious. You see, there is actually a genre of game similar to this that's very popular in Eastern Europe. I'm not sure if it really penetrated all the way to the West. It's basically Deus Ex meets Far Cry. Okay, it's Stalker. But with more RPG elements and a bunch no more, more systems yet, that interact okay. with systems, I more immersive sim elements. Well, a bunch of them were made in Poland, in Ukraine, in Russia, and this area of the world. Many of them have gone unknown past the Berlin Wall, even after it fell. Many of them are janky as hell, but they speak of a desire of a certain type of game, and Chrome sort of scratched that itch back in the day. And it did it well enough for me to want to play it at 5 frames a second or 2 frames a second sometimes. What, 15 minute load times for that last mission. The last mission, by the way, is something that you get to choose since you have the ability to decide who you're gonna back in the story. Doesn't really make much difference, but hey, it, it's, it's, it's there. It had that feature to make you feel like what you do matters. How you approach a situation matters. Sure, it did have that one force stealth mission because every goddamn game has to have one, but for the most part, this was very much in the DNA of Far Cry 2, which is a game that lets you approach your objectives however way you see fit if you have the tools at your disposal and the wits to use them. I'm not saying you should go out and play it now because it's super duper important, but maybe it will give you some perspective on the FPS genre as it was before Far Cry became the thing that everybody tried to emulate. Just know that unless you can cap the frame rate, it will be an absolutely joyless and extremely aggravating experience. The game also had a sequel that nobody played, and it was supposed to have another one, but Techland decided it wanted to make money and games that people actually played, so it did other stuff. It did Call of Juarez, which was a great game, and its sequel, which was also a great game, and then they did the third one, which people want to forget it exists and then they made a fourth one which was okay it was novel and then they made dead island which people want to kind of forget it existed and then they made dying light which was amazing and now dying light 2 which i haven't played and hell raid which they never finished and just stuffed it as dlc into dying light 1. actually while browsing through the data files to install that fan-made patch i did come across some texture files called dying light Weird coincidence. Anywho, catch you next time. Steel. Maybe what a game that's easier to SEO than this one. I should just put a tag saying, no, not the dinosaur one. Hopefully it helps. Goodbye.